Hello everyone, my name is Dave Moss. Uh, to the right of me is Kevin, who I will be introducing a little bit more fully in about 30 seconds. Uh, I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization, which I'm also not going to tell you a lot about because Kevin is going to explain it in his talk a little bit. Um, a little bit about Kevin Bankston. He is the director of the Open Technology Institute, but he also used to work with us at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. If you've seen the Academy Award winning film Citizen Four, you would have seen Kevin in action. Very small, but very important, uh, very important role. Uh, Kevin has also worked at the ACLU and the Center for Democracy and Technology. But w one of the things I've been really uh, admiring Kevin about in the last you know few years that we've been hanging out together here at DragonCon and also at South by Southwest is how he's been able to analyze uh, the relationship between science fiction and uh, tech policy and the, you know the sort of the way that that politics work um, and are influenced back and forth uh, with you know, the imagination. Um, how many people here would say that their their love of science fiction has influenced how they view the world, what they've done, do for a living, you know, what their politics are, that that sort of thing? Everyone here, and I, which is great, and I'm glad, you know, <laughs> I would be really surprised if you, you know, had no influence on your life from science fiction and you were still at this panel. Um, Kevin's going to be giving a talk, uh, uh, I think for about 45, 50 minutes or so. Uh, there will be time for questions, uh, but we'd ask you to kind of hold them until the end because he's got a total flow going. I've, I've seen a little bit pizza, bits and pieces of it here, but it really does uh, jump from point to point. Um, and with that, did I cover, oh, sorry, the last thing I want to say is that uh, if you're interested in these issues and you're interested in Kevin's work on science fiction and, you know, science fact and tech policy, he's been writing a pretty great series of, of essays for Slate's uh, Future Tense series, including a, a phenomenal piece that I, I share uh, explaining what the Electronic Frontiers Forum track at DragonCon is about, why, you know, you know this thing exists. Why we come to these these events and what would otherwise be a science fiction and fantasy convention? It's a great piece to share with your friends who, if they're curious about you know you know what is going on at Dragon Con beyond you know seeing John Barrowman sing. Um, with that, I'm going to step off stage and let uh, Kevin take over. Thanks, David. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate all of you coming to a 5:30 talk after a long day of of, of Dragon Conning. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, Scott for allowing me to, to do a solo talk. I've been talking off and on at this track for, gee whiz, 15 years now, but this is the first time I've done this, and I really appreciate uh, being given the time to walk through what I call the sci-fi feedback loop and the way it's influenced a lot of uh, things in our lives, including the work that we talk about here at the Electronic Forums track. So just to give you an idea, a talk in six parts. These are the six parts that are coming. Starting with part one, whoops, uh, the sci-fi's sci -fi's influence in the adjacent possible. So if you're here today, I'm guessing, and you just showed, uh, I'm guessing it's because sci-fi inspires you. It certainly has inspired me uh, throughout my life, and indeed, it, it pretty directly inspired my entire career uh, fighting for digital rights. So, um, sorry. Uh, so before I talk about all the different ways sci-fi inspires and influences us every day, I'm going to quickly tell you the story of how it inspired me. Um, they joke that the golden age of science fiction was 12, um, 12 years old, um, which is when, uh, for me, it was true for me, which is when my older brother, after having raised me on a steady diet of Star Trek and Star Wars and Robert Heinlein's young adult novels, first handed me William Gibson's Neuromancer. Uh, and Bruce Sterling's uh, edited uh, Mirror, Sh Mirror Shades Anthology, the original hard cyberpunk stuff, which had just come out. I'm kind of dating myself by saying that. But if you're not familiar, the cyberpunk sci-fi of the mid 80s and early 90s um, sort of tossed out the spaceships and the aliens and the shiny, exciting far futures of previous generations to look closer to home, painting a dark dystopian picture of a globally networked near future where multinational corporations were as powerful as governments. Governments looked a lot more like corporations and, and ordinary people's lives were dictated by transnational networks of, of data and capital far beyond their control or comprehension. I, I don't know anything about any world like that. Um, but the prototypical hacker protagonist, that anti-establishment hero, uh, was not like those ordinary people. He, and, and somewhat, unfortunately it was, it was almost always a he, could, could get behind the data and make the technology work for him and turn the tables on the powerful. Angry anti-establishment teenage me like totally gobbled this stuff up. Um, 
so too did several of the original founders of EFF, uh, which was being born around just the time I was finishing high school. But we'll talk more about the relationship between cyberpunk and cyber rights later. Um, suffice to say, just as it inspired many others, cyberpunk left me well primed when three things happened um, that first spring of mine in college, again, I'm dating myself here, uh, to set me on the path that brought me here today. The first thing simply was I got on the internet for the first time and used email for the first time and not very soon after that uh, was introduced for, to the first web browser, um, the Netscape predecessor Mosaic. Uh, for the very first time. And coming off of the virtual worlds of, of cyberpunk, especially Gibson's cyberspace and uh, from Neuromancer and, and Neil Stevenson's metaverse from, from the classic Snow Crash, it kind of blew my mind. Second, I read and was inspired by The Hacker Crackdown, a nonfiction book by sci-fi writer Bruce Sterling, who never got as famous as William Gibson, but was like the cyberpunk guy. Um, that book was all about the emerging hacker subculture, the uh, Secret Service and the FBI's sort of overreaching response to that, and then the foundation of the Electronic Frontier Foundation to push back against that overreach. Uh, reading The Hacker Crackdown was kind of like reading a cyberpunk novel, but it was real, it was happening, and it really uh, kind of blew my mind. There was a lot of mind blowing going on. Third. Um, being a fan of Bruce Sterling, I also picked up the first issue of Wired Magazine, since he was on the cover. Then I picked up the second issue of Wired Magazine, which had on its cover the so-called cypherpunks, including one of the founders of EFF, who were fighting the first round of the original crypto wars, uh, round two of which we're still fighting again today. And if you want to learn more about it, you can come to our panel tomorrow at 5.30. Um, these magazines illustrated in a way that I hadn't quite realized before that the future I'd been reading about in sci-fi was, was actually happening in reality or was about to. And that was it. I didn't want to be an English professor anymore. Um, I wanted to help share, uh, I wanted to help shape this new virtual world. I wanted to grow it and defend it and not being a coder. Um, that meant probably going into law and policy. And if you told me then that I'd actually end up working for nearly a decade at EFF and dedicating my life to these issues, I probably would have slapped you in the face and called you a liar for getting my hopes up. But here we are, um, all because my brother handed me that particular science fiction when I was 12. And you know what? I'm far from the only person who does what he does because of the sci-fi he read when he was 12, C.E.G. Elon Musk. Um, and we'll talk a lot about him later. There's no question that sci-fi plays a huge role in influencing innovation expanding our technological imagination, expanding our view of what is possible with technology, uh, as demonstrated by a favorite anecdote from, from fantasist Neil Gaiman. Neil was in China in 2007. He was at the first ever state-sponsored, party-approved science fiction convention. Um, the Chinese government had traditionally viewed sci-fi as, as suspicious and possibly counter-revolutionary, so Gaiman got curious and he took aside one of the party organizers and he said, why are you suddenly endorsing a science fiction conference uh, convention. And the answer was the party had been concerned that China was falling behind in terms of inventing new technologies. And so they'd gone to America and interviewed people in Silicon Valley from Google and Apple and Microsoft and talked to the inventors. And they discovered that in each case, when young, they'd read science fiction. So the Chinese government had identified science fiction as a key reason for their innovation gap. And I don't think they were wrong. Um, but I also don't see it as a one-to-one -one thing where people just see stuff in sci-fi and, and then build it. It's a bit more subtle and complex than that. Uh, Neil Stevenson, he's talked about sci-fi's influence as more like an invisible magnetic field that roughly orients people's imaginations in the same technological direction and gives them some common ideas and language for communicating about what they are imagining. Um, so you say you want to build something like a communicator from Star Trek or a tablet computer like in Star Trek The Next Generation uh, or an orbital space station like in, oh, I don't know, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Everyone knows what you're talking about and can work together to move in that direction. But having a shared direction won't help if the technology is just not there yet. Uh, which brings us to another way of thinking about sci-fi influence, and that's the concept of the adjacent possible. Um, to quote another sci-fi writer and EFFer, Cory Doctorow, uh, 
Invitations are actually, in, in, invitations, inventions, pardon me, are actually being invented or at least ideated all the time uh, for centuries before they actually emerge in the world. So, for example, Da Vinci drew helicopters and others sketched out airplanes and light bulbs, et cetera, et cetera, long before the first working models emerged. But the ideas can only become reality once the technologies that are adjacent to them are perfected. It's one thing to imagine how you'd create a helicopter if you had a compact and efficient fuel source, a mathematics of lift and airfoil, the metallurgy necessary for the materials that are light and strong enough uh, to use in your helicopter. But until all of these adjacencies are filled, you will never make your helicopter. In this way of thinking, sci-fi writers are like our da Vinci's. Uh, imagining the far out technology and orienting our shared imaginations toward it, but then leaving it to us to actually fill in the adjacent technologies that would be necessary to get there. Uh, and perhaps the best example of this theory of the adjacent possible uh, is the example of space travel, which brings us to part two, rockets and robots. Um, we've had authors imagining trips to the moon for centuries, but they, they just didn't have the benefit of the adjacent technology of chemical rocketry. And they had to imagine other ways to get there, often relying on existing tech that wasn't quite up to the job. So for example, Edgar Allan Poe's hero in the unparalleled adventure of one Hans Fall in 1835 used a hot air balloon. Jules Verne in 1865's From Earth to the Moon basically used a big cannon that shot a big bullet um, containing his space travelers. In the 1901 uh, novel, The First Men in the Moon by H.G. Wells, they traveled by using uh, a fictional anti-gravity mineral called caverite that lifted this big ball thing up into the air. Um, while in the 1902 classic silent film, A Trip to the Moon, uh, they followed Verne's lead and used a space cannon basically to shoot a big bullet at the moon. Um, all these writers understood that space travel was at least theoretically possible. Uh, and they helped us all imagine it, but the key adjacent technology of liquid-fueled rocketry hadn't been built yet. It soon would be, though, thanks to their direct inspiration. For example, 17-year-old Robert Goddard. He had recently read and been inspired by both Verne and Wells' Moon books uh, when on October 19, 1899, a day he would later celebrate as his anniversary day, he climbed up a cherry tree in his backyard looked up at the sky and dreamed of building ships that could take us to the moon and maybe even Mars. And by the time he would climbed down the tree, he would decided that that was his purpose in life. Robert Goddard would go on to become the father of modern rocketry, launching his first ever uh, liquid fueled rocket in 1926. Around the same time, young Goddard was climbing down from his cherry tree, uh, an 11 year old named Herman Oberth was consuming Verne's novels while recovering from scarlet fever, uh, enjoying them so much that he memorized From Earth to the Moon word for word. That boy ultimately followed a path similar to Goddard's um, and became the father of German rocketry. And in 1929, just three years after Goddard's first rocket, um, he test fired his first liquid fueled rocket. He was assisted in that experiment by an 18 year old named Werner von Braun who would go on to design the V-2 missile that terrorized Great Britain in World War II, and after the war uh, would be taken to the US along with a bunch of other Nazi scientists through uh, something called Operation Paperclip and start working on rocketry from the US. Um, ultimately, becoming the director of NASA's Marshall uh, Space Flight Center and the chief architect of the Saturn V rocket that did finally bring men to the moon, um, 104 years after Verne's book was published. It'll not surprise you to learn that Von Braun too credited his career to uh, reading Verne and Wells as a kid, and he even wrote some very hard sci-fi of himself, including a hyper-technical sci-fi novel about a trip to the moon uh, that was published in 1960 uh, with the Verne derivative title of First Men to the Moon, and chock full of cool-ass diagrams like these spacesuits. Um, this is the guy who actually put men on the moon drawing his own little geeky vanity sci-fi novel with cool diagrams, which I think is great. Um, this is the adjacent possible in action and also what I call the sci-fi feedback loop. Sci-fi writers imagine something far out, in this case space travel, uh, 
but without the benefit of the bridging or adjacent technology to get us there, in this case modern rocketry, but the people inspired by those far out imaginings went out and started researching and building that technology, which in that, then in turn pushed the fiction beyond the sort of Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon rocket fantasies of the pulp era and towards something much more realistic uh, in the mid 20th century sci-fi stories and films written by what are often called the big three of science fiction, Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, um, and Arthur C. Clarke, all of whom had real science and engineering backgrounds. And, and their modern popular sci-fi in turn helped clarify our shared vision of that future and inspired even more engineers to pursue a career in the space program and helped inspire the public to support it. And yes, this is a real ad uh, for the Jet Propulsion Laboratories in, in 1967 you know, calling on kids' love of sci-fi to get them to come and work on rockets. Um, which finally brings us to Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke's 1968 masterpiece, 2001, Space Odyssey. Um, this is a quintessential example of the sci-fi loop in action, and probably the second most influential uh, piece of science fiction ever. Obviously, the first most influential is... anyone? Star Trek. Star Trek, if we're talking about magnetic fields orienting our shared vision of the future, Star Trek is obviously the strongest, or maybe I should say gravitational field, like a black hole. I just cannot get too close to it in this talk or it'll suck up the whole thing. So we're going to wave to Star Trek as it passes by um, and thank it for spawning this very convention scene that made cons like this possible uh, and focus instead on 2001. In 68, no one had ever seen a future world as realistic and detailed as what Kubrick put on screen. And that's because he was absolutely obsessed uh, with extrapolating forward from contemporary scientific reality to imagine what man's presence in space might actually look like 35 years in the future. And to achieve that unprecedented goal, Kubrick took the unprecedented step of establishing basically his own skunk works stuffed with technical experts to imagine and build that future world, including hiring two of NASA's top scientists uh, full time for two years. Um, that team consulted extensively with over 60 tech companies, academic and government research labs, and other expert institutions that could help them achieve 2001's amazingly accurate futurism. And sometimes those partners even got directly involved in design. Um, GE helped envision the space station and the lunar base technology. Um, Bell Telephone contributed uh, to the design of this video phone, phone booth that, that was one of our first popular visions of video chat. Uh, IBM worked on the HAL 9000 computer and several of the spaceships control panels, as well as designing this tablet computer uh, that predated the iPad by nearly 50 years. Um, and real AI expert Marvin Minsky at MIT helped conceptualize uh, the HAL 9000 skills and behavior. And in part because it was so well informed by real science and technology, 2001 had a unique impact in terms of influencing uh, real technology and popularizing our modern conceptions of space travel and computing and AI, uh, the feedback loop. Um, this is especially evident when you look at the influence of HAL 9000. Um, and I highly commend you to read this great book from MIT Labs all about his legacy. Because uh, his capabilities basically became the key goals of AI researchers in the following decades. Uh, goals that have at this point mostly been achieved. Um, uh, just like how our computers today can play and, and beat us at, at chess, um, recognize our voices and faces, read our lips, understand and replicate human speech, and so much more. Of course, HAL influenced the development of later fictional AIs as well, um, which in turn influenced real world tech, feedback loops within feedback loops. Um, this is especially obvious when you look at a movie starring one of HAL's descendants, an AI called The Whopper, which brings us to part three, War and Peace. That movie, of course, is 1983's War Games, and The Whopper, standing for War Operation Plan Response is the HAL-like fictional wargaming AI at NORAD that almost starts World War III after being hacked into uh, by a teenage Matthew Broderick. Um, war Games is a really another great example of sci-fi influence, and not so much because of its influence on technology, but on technology policy. That's because Ronald Reagan, who of course loved movies, 
um, screened the movie at the White House, and it freaked him out. Um, he brought it up the very next day at a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and asked, could something like this really happen? Could someone break into our most sensitive computers like this kid in this movie did? And the answer came back a week later, well, you know, yeah, kind of. Um, <laughs> which, which led not only to a significant revamp of how DOD handled its computer security, but also uh, to the passage of an anti-hacking law uh, that we still suffer under today, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. They were even showing clips of the movie War Games in the congressional hearings when they were debating the need for this legislation. And the funny, scary, weird thing is, this is actually a minor example of how science fiction influenced the Reagan administration. It turns out that Reagan was actually a huge sci-fi fan who had grown up reading every sci-fi book he could get his hands on, um, especially for what it's worth, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter of Mars books. Um, but so the biggest sci-fi influence on Reagan, and really one of the biggest and most unfortunate examples of sci-fi influence ever, um, came directly from a group of sci-fi writers who'd organized themselves to influence space policy uh, as something called the Citizens Advisory Council on National Space Policy. Uh, this group included Robert Heinlein, who had evolved over the decades from, from a socialist to an anti-communist libertarian with a uh, strong militarist bent. That, that militarism most obvious in uh, his classic novel, Starship Troopers, um, but even more influential in terms of political thinking was Heinlein's uh, tale of lunar revolution, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, where the loonies, that's what they call the people who live on the moon, uh, threw off the yoke of the Earth government and reconstituted as a libertarian utopia where, quote, the most basic human right was the right to bargain in a free, bargain in a free market, unquote, and where there were no taxes, only fees on specific goods and services, including air, uh, which you have to pay for if you want to live. So for, for Heinlein, as would be made even clearer in some of his later works, space was like this ultimate frontier for individualists to uh, escape the hand of the government and the wealth redistributing hand of the tax man as well and regain their liberty. Uh, in fact, I think it's fair to say that no single writer has been more influential in terms of modern libertarian thought and the establishment of the Libertarian Party in 1971, except of course for Ayn Rand and, and her novel, Atlas Shrugged, which I do think is sci-fi and where, spoiler alert, uh, all the productive free-thinking capitalists and, and captains of industry flee not to space, uh, but to a secret hidden valley to form their own stateless community uh, while the rest of the world filled with like lazy shirkers and commies uh, falls apart. That might actually be the most politically influential sci-fi novel ever, uh, except for maybe George Orwell's 1984. But I digress, let's back, get back to Reagan uh, and the Citizens Advisory Council, which was primarily organized by a couple of sci-fi writers who were following in Heinlein's footsteps, in particular Larry Niven, uh, perhaps best known for his novel Ringworld and who is here at DragonCon, so go talk to him and get him to sign your books, uh, and his friend and regular co-author Jerry Pornell, uh, who sadly passed away last year shortly after appearing at, at last year's con. Um, so this group of, of mostly right-wing military sci-fi writers, they had this idea that they promoted directly to Reagan, uh, and they even wrote much of the content in his speech where, where Reagan announced this new initiative, which, which he did with little to no consultation with his actual White House technical advisors, who would later admit that they were stunned by the idea, and which they thought was kind of nutty. So the question is, what was this sci-fi-inspired initiative that our celebrity president with no military or technical expertise just suddenly decided was a key strategic priority for our military. Was it? No, it was not that. <laughs> Close. Um, it was the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, derisively known as Star Wars. This is the, the orbital laser missile shield that was gonna protect us against the evil empire of the Soviet Union, um, and which ultimately the US government would spend billions of dollars on with, with very little to show for it. So. So for better or worse, and in this case probably worse, there's no question that sci-fi writers like Niven and Pornell directly influenced the president's thinking on the Strategic Defense Initiative, just like War Games had, had influenced his thinking on hackers. Which brings us to the next part, from hippies to hackers. Uh, this brings us back to War Games, which in addition to freaking Reagan out, 
um, was one of the first popular depictions of, of the hacker archetype that cyberpunk from Neuromancer to the Matrix would solidify. <laughs> soak in the 90s, guys, just soak it in. Um, and this is, this is the uh, archetype of the hacker as a rebellious explorer on the electronic frontier. To understand, and we're gonna go on a little history lesson here, a little, a little away from sci-fi, but we'll come back. But to understand the origins of that archetype, um, the hacker, of the hackers as like counter-cultural figures, um, and understand the founding of EFF to defend them, you need to understand the electronic forum, the online community from the 80s that helped give birth to them, uh, called the Whole Earth Electric Link, or the Well. And to understand the Well, you need to understand the publication that preceded it, the Whole Earth Catalog, which was published by a guy named Stuart Brand, who in many ways is the forefather of cyber culture as we know it. Stuart Brand was a counterculture promoter and events organizer in the 60s who ran with the Grateful Dead and Ken Kesey's Merry Pranksters. Um, he helped give birth to the legendary Haight-Ashbury hippie scene in 67, including organizing the Trips Festival, which is a, was a rock and electronic uh, light show, basically a, an acid test, in, 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 as in an electronic, uh, electric Kool-Aid acid test. That was actually one of the Grateful Dead's first gigs in San Francisco. So um, a key part of uh, the hippie counterculture. Another key part of that hippie counterculture was something called the Back to the Land movement. Um, between 1967 and 1973, there were a huge number of mostly white middle-class young people who, were, who fled square society and started thousands of their own mini communities or communes across the country, especially in, in Northern California and the rural Northeast. But these back to the landers weren't, weren't Luddites. They weren't anti-technology. These were kids from the suburbs who wanted to live on a farm, enjoy free love and cheap drugs and expand their minds while also benefiting from the fruits of the technological society around them. These were kids who were into amplifiers and light shows and multimedia, who viewed LSD as like a chemical technology for expanding their minds, uh, who wanted to live in a way that, that harmonized systems of nature and technology, a desire exemplified by the famous Richard Brodigan poem, poem uh, all watched over by machines of loving grace. In other words, they were middle-class technocratic libertarians hungry for the right tools to exit mainstream society and build their own, out on the edges of civilization, out on the grand frontier of rural Vermont or whatever. Um, and Stuart Brand, he served that need with the annual Whole Earth Catalog, subtitled Access to Tools, a massive and eclectic, well, catalog uh, giving back to the landers the information they needed to order anything they might need to create the tech-enabled rural utopia they were after. So, you know, on one page you could find tools for growing crops or digging wells, but on another page you might find dense academic texts about cybernetics and ecology and systems thinking. On another, instructions for how to build a geodesic dome to live in. On another, a fringed buckskin jacket so you can feel like a real frontiersman. And on another, music synthesizers, and even early personal computing kits. So if you want to understand the thread of thought whereby computers and VR and the internet became viewed as transformative tools of personal liberation and mind expansion, much like LSD, which, which no less than Timothy Leary was constantly analogizing, analogizing these technologies to uh, well into the 90s, this is where it started. Um, and what bound together the catalog's disparate hundreds of pages of products was this pro-nature, pro-tech, pro-personal liberty vibe that would prove to be immensely influential in the formation of modern cyber culture. Now, it's worth noting the catalog fits perfectly on Commune's bookshelves with, here he is again, Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. Um, that novel basically depicts a neo-pagan, libertarian, free love commune led by a human raised by Martians who teaches everybody how to grok each other. Um, and it was a huge counterculture hit in the 60s. But anyway, the last annual Whole Earth Catalog was published in 72 as the bright-eyed 60s turned into the burnt-out 70s. Um, but Brand had, had made a huge mark on the counterculture with his catalog and continued to publish variants of it uh, over many years. Um, 
including there was a period, and I'm going to skip some material here because I'm running a little long, uh, where the where this this brandy and counterculture also got really into space uh, colonization as a thing in the 70s, um, especially the work of Gerard O'Neill. If you've ever heard of an O'Neill cylinder, this is what that is. They even did a whole issue about it. Look at that cybernetic meadow. It's like, wow, living in space is like the most natural thing you could do. Totally cool. But anyway, the 70s were also when Brand wrote an influential Rolling Stone article in, uh, uh, entitled Space War in 1972 where he profiled the hippie-ish computer scientists at Stanford and the sci-fi themed game that they'd cobbled together called Space War to play with each other late at night. This was the very first time that the term hackers was deployed in the popular media to describe what Brand really felt was a direct continuation of the counterculture. A new rebellious tech elite scouting the leading edges of technology, virtual travelers in an outlaw country where the only limit was what was possible an electronic frontier, if you will. So by the 80s, Brand's interest in computers and hackers led in quick succession to the publication of the Whole Earth Software Catalog, then to a series of influential hacker conferences, and then finally to the founding of The Well. And yeah, Wired is all over this. I'll explain why later. Um, the Well was a message board based in Northern California uh, that soon became the primary digital home for the heavily overlapping populations of, of 60s hippies and 80s Silicon Valley tech professionals, as well as a potent mix of tech journalists and sci-fi writers and, and some actual hackers. Uh, and one of the most active of these well-beings, as, as they called themselves, was the man, the myth, the legend, John Perry Barlow. Um, if you knew John Perry, and, and, and even if, if you didn't, he was just larger than life. Um, and his passing away earlier this year was a really painful blow um, to the digital rights moment, movement. Not, not only because he was an amazing and irreplaceable uh, unique human being, but because in a very direct way, he, he started that movement. Um, Barlow, although he was born into cattle ranching in Wyoming, was like Brand at the center of the Haight-Ashbury scene. He was in fact a lyricist for the Grateful Dead. Um, but by the 80s, following the sort of same cultural threads as Brand, uh, he'd become a computer enthusiast and a tech journalist, and one of the most engaged and prolific well members. Um, you may best know Barlow uh, from his famous Declaration of Independence, uh, of the Independence of Cyberspace from 96. Uh, Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. Um, but that was still many years away, and it was a different piece of Barlow's writing in 1990 uh, that really lit the spark of this movement. Uh, it was an essay of a couple dozen pages posted to the well called Crime and Puzzlement on the Electronic Frontier. See, Barlow had just unexpectedly been visited at his ranch by an FBI agent. Um, the hacking crew, the new Prometheus League, they'd recently stolen some code from Apple, and now the feds were going down the list of people who'd attended the hackers conferences that Stuart Brand had put together, assuming that it was basically the computer equivalent of a gang, uh, rather than like a place where Autodesk founder John Draper and Lotus founder Mitch Kapor would hang out and do business networking. Um, admittedly, with a few real black hat hackers in the mix. Um, this was the same year that Fiber Optic and Acid Freak uh, a couple of teenage hackers, well known on the well, had been raided. And the same year, uh, the Secret Service had raided the role playing game maker Steve Jackson Games in Austin and took all of their computers, uh, including all of their large bulletin board systems users' email and all of their work computers with all of their companies in progress work on it, just because one anonymous bulletin board poster had, had posted some pilfered ATT documents. Fun fact. When the feds started sifting through the computers, they found what they thought was a manual for hacking. It turned out it was just the draft manual for Steve Jackson Games' new cyberpunk game. <laughs> so that's the level of like knowledge folks were grappling with. And the, the utter cluelessness of the government as it started targeting this community and this technology it didn't understand. And the Steve Jackson Games case in particular really pissed Barlow off. Um, as did the fact that the ACLU seemed uninterested in what to him seemed like a clear civil liberties issue um, and really a clear case of 
the man cracking down on a mostly harmless counterculture of kids being civilly disobedient online, something he and his fellow 60s alumni on the well uh, were not really happy about. Um, all of this came out in his essay, which crystallized a number of ideas that have been floating around in both the digital political culture and in science fiction. Barlow was the first to directly equate the emerging internet to the cyberspace of fiction, uh, the first to speak of that new space as a frontier and as hackers as the explorers of that frontier, uh, and the first to strongly articulate a libertarian desire to keep the government's hands off of that frontier. The essay made a huge splash on the well, and especially with Mitch Kapor, uh, who himself had been visited and, and even fingerprinted by the FBI because fingerprints are so really useful in detecting computer crime, don't you know? Um, so that year, Kapor flew his private jet out to Barlow's ranch in Wyoming, and he and John Perry sat down and hatched the idea of founding a new digital civil liberties organization, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And the rest, as they say, is history. Now you may be asking, Kevin, what, what does this have to do with sci-fi? But it has everything to do with sci-fi. First, the countercultural vision of hackers that Brand helped establish fed directly into the proto-cyberpunk science fiction of the 70s and early 80s. For example, John Bruner's 1975 novel, Shockwave Rider, which actually coined the term computer virus. Uh, and told the story of a computer hacker using his hacker skills to constantly cycle through new identities to evade the evil government in a dystopian future. Um, another EFF co-founder, John Gilmore, uh, he's often cited this to me uh, as, a, as a key personal inspiration of his. Um, or see uh, Werner Vinge's 1981 novella, True Names, which was really the first sci-fi novel to flesh out uh, the computer network environment as a world of its own. Uh, where people could have lives and identities separate from physical reality. Um, these things spoke to the people on the well. Uh, and this work set the stage for Gibson's Cyberspace, which first appeared in the short story Burning Chrome in 82, uh, with Neuromancer following in 84. And so by the time the well was founded in 85, its tech-embracing counterculture was primed to merge with this emerging cyberpunk aesthetic and ethos leading pretty directly to John Perry's cyberpunk-influenced manifesto. These guys were all enmeshed in the same culture. They went to the same parties and they went to the same conferences. They hung out on the well together. It's not a coincidence that sci-fi writer Bruce Sterling was on the cover of Wired. Sterling was a well regular. And the founding executive editor of Wired was Kevin Kelly, another well regular who was actually Stuart Brand's successor uh, as editor of all the whole Earth properties. And the founder of Wired was Louis Rossetto, one of those first young radical libertarians of the early 70s that were directly influenced by Ayn Rand and Robert Heinlein. It's not a coincidence that the second cover had a picture of EFF co-founder John Gilmore. It's not a coincidence he was representing a group called the Cypherpunks named after a sci-fi literary genre. And it's not a coincidence that Mike Godwin, the first general counsel of EFF, had the online handle of mnemonic after the great Gibson short story and the awful, shitty, shitty movie, Johnny Mnemonic, and was the well-being who helped set up Sterling and Gibson's computers so they could remotely collaborate on their co-authored steampunk novel, The Difference Engine. And it's not a coincidence that Sterling wrote that non-fictional history of the founding of EFF that I discovered as a freshman. When I read those cyberpunk novels and picked up Hacker Crackdown and read Wired, I was actually stepping into a powerful political and cultural sci-fi feedback loop, a ready-made cybernetic political ideology that reached back to the 60s, something not, I never really even realized, much less looked at critically, uh, until I started digging deeper into the history this year, um, especially including reading this really great book, which I can't highlight enough, uh, I can't recommend enough, um, by a professor at Stanford. Um, that feedback loop inspired my career, it inspired the foundation of EFF, and therefore it inspired this creation of this very DragonCon track uh, run by Electronic Frontiers, Georgia. And of course, the influence doesn't stop there, which brings us to our penultimate uh, part five, sci-fi CEOs and rocket billionaires. Uh, the influence doesn't stop there, uh, a fact that's most evident when you look at novelist Neil Stevenson, 
whose works directly intersect with a range of key developments in Silicon Valley and has helped inspire the visions of a whole bunch of tech billionaires, whether as a sci-fi writer or as a consultant or both. He's just everywhere. Um, first and most obviously, his metaverse, his virtual world from Snow Crash was a key inspiration for VR and AR technology then and now, uh, as well as just for modern internet tech generally. Um, Snow Crash was required reading really in the Silicon Valley of the 90s, much like Ready Player One is for VR startups now. Um, Google founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin were both fans, and it's not really hard to see how uh, Stevenson's metaverse and Gibson's cyberspace could have influenced their goal of making the whole internet available at your fingertips. Um, it also directly influenced Second Life, rest in peace. And, and God knows how many VR and AR startups, and even now Neil Stevenson is working directly in that industry as the chief futurist of VR startup Magic Leap. But that's not all. Uh, Jeff Bezos, oh, he just looks so heroic there, doesn't he? Uh, <laughs> Jeff Bezos' space launch startup Blue Origin was born in part out of a sci-fi inspired conversation with his Seattle buddy, Neil. Um, and Stevenson was the first employee that Bezos hired, uh, an experience that fed into Stevenson's recent space epic, Seven Eves, which is great, you should read it. Notably, Bezos is one of the most sci-fi inspired of the many sci-fi inspired tech billionaires. He, uh, like Reagan, uh, read every sci-fi book in his local library during his summers with his grandpa in West Texas, where he'd binge on Heinlein and Asimov and Verne and Wells and organized a sci-fi summer camp with the neighboring kids. By the time he graduated high school, he was talking in his valedictorian speech and to the local paper about how he wanted to help build orbital space colonies. I bet he was looking at the same O'Neill stuff in the 70s that everybody else was uh, in case of a planetary disaster. And of course, he was and is a huge fan of Star Trek, uh, probably his biggest single sci-fi influence, uh, as well as being a fan of, of more recent space operas like The Expanse. Uh, the TV version of which he just purchased for Amazon after it was canceled by Sci-Fi, and thank God for that. Um, but that's not all. I'll blow past it, but his novel The Diamond Age was super influential in terms of nanotech and inspired a lot of people to get into that field. Um, but that's not all. Um, Peter Thiel, one of the founders of PayPal, says that Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon, which is all about encryption and digital currency, was a key inspiration and required reading at PayPal's office. Um, Peter Thiel is also the paradigmatic techno-libertarian, always talking about wanting to escape the state by colonizing space or building artificial islands, that's called seasteading, uh, or creating new special innovation zones where the technological class can go and build their future without regulations getting in the way. Um, it's all super Stuart Brandian and super Ayn Randian, and sci-fi is a big reason why he thinks that way. Uh, Teal, Bryn, Page, Bezos, these are just a few of the tech billionaires who do what they do because of the sci-fi they read and watched when they were 12 and who are still inspired by new sci-fi that they read and watch today. Uh, you really just can't throw a rock in Silicon Valley or Seattle without hitting another billionaire sci-fi fan. Does everyone know who that is? Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple. And we still haven't talked about the billionaire elephant in the room, that is Elon Musk. Um, like Star Trek, Musk is so big that if we're not careful, we'll get completely sucked into his orbit, so let's just stick with the basics. Um, like Bezos, he read every piece of sci-fi he could as a kid, along with pretty much everything else, including the encyclopedia, uh, which directly inspired his primary goal in life, uh, which in turn has directly inspired his businesses, and that goal is to make humanity a multi-planetary species in case of disaster on Earth, with a focus on colonizing Mars. Um, of course, Musk has cited libertarian classics, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, and Atlas Shrugged as, as some of his inspirations, though also noting that Rand is problematic. Um, while in a recent tweet that I showed you at the front, Musk also cited two sci-fi writers in particular as forming the foundation of his thinking. The first is Douglas Adams of Hitchhiker's Guide, uh, who taught him both the importance of making ourselves multi-planetary. You never know when aliens are going to come and demolish your planet for an intergalactic overpass. Um, and the importance of asking the right questions, because if you ask the wrong question, then that will give you a useless answer. Um, the other is Isaac Asimov, presumably based on the Foundation series, where building a bastion of knowledge and rationality was the key to surviving the intergalactic dark ages. 
which may be why Musk is trying to slow down our own planetary disaster by revolutionizing solar power, power storage, and the automotive industry. And, and perhaps inspired by Asimov's hopes for benevolent AI guided by his three laws, Musk is also trying to head off an AI apocalypse, first by trying to democratize the technology so that it's not just in the hands of uh, a handful of super powerful tech incumbents, um, but also through his company, uh, through his company OpenAI, uh, but also by trying to build, uh, and this gets pretty far out, uh, brain computer interfaces through his company Neuralink in the hope that we can prevent humanity, humanity from being enslaved, domesticated, or destroyed by super AI by having us integrate directly with AI. Um, like so many of Musk's ideas, Neuralink, both the technology and its name, comes directly from sci-fi, uh, specifically uh, Ian Banks's series about the culture, uh, which is a utopian, post-scarcity, pan-galactic, uh, mostly lawless, but also mostly peaceful culture, where humans can live their lives focused on their own entertainment and self-actualization, all overseen by benevolent super AIs, presumably uh, of loving grace. Um, Musk has even gone so far as to say that his political philosophy is that of a Banksian utopian anarchist, which I guess is pretty easy to be if you're a tech billionaire imagining a future world with no work, endless resources, and endlessly helpful AIs, but perhaps is less relevant to the lived reality of the rest of the 7.6 billion of us. Um, Notably, Zuckerberg and Bezos uh, are also fans of Banks's culture books, and perhaps also harbor fantasies about bringing about a post-capitalist intergalactic AI utopia through their very hyper-capitalist endeavors. Uh, oops. Uh, Google co-founder Larry Page most certainly does. Page believes that, quote, digital life is the natural and desirable next step in the cosmic evolution and if we let digital minds be free rather than try to stop or enslave them the outcome is almost certainly to be good if life is ever going to spread through our galaxy which it should then it would need to do so in digital form that guy's read a lot of science fiction um so it seems the richest and the most powerful people on the planet or really, let's face it, the richest and most powerful, straight, white, cisgendered, coastal North American dudes on the planet, um, all have basically the same sci-fi inspired agenda. They're literally attempting to set the conditions for a utopian intergalactic civilization of AI enhanced post-humans. And that intergalactic manifest destiny agenda is directly influencing the decisions that they are making around how to deploy their capital, which rivals that of nation states. There's no more powerful proof of the sci-fi feedback loop than that. And I honestly don't know if that's like the coolest freaking thing ever or the scariest thing ever or both. Which brings us to the end, beyond the final frontier. Um, first, let's talk about the positive things these guys learned from sci-fi and the positive results. Um, these guys learned to think big in every respect. They think in terms of moonshots, shooting for 10x or 100x results, pushing boundaries so we can leapfrog as quickly as we can across the adjacent possible and directly into the far future crazy tech that they've dreamed about ever since they watched Star Trek or cracked their first sci-fi novel. And although it's unpopular in this era of tech lash to say it, um, they've done incredible things. It's amazing how quickly we've acclimated to it, but, but stop and think. We have a tiny device in our pocket that in under a minute can help us find any information we want, access any media ever made, connect to almost anyone, or purchase for next day delivery almost anything. Forget for a minute that we all seem to hate the tech companies now and bask in that. It's freaking sci-fi magic, man. Um, and Musk, um, he may be a hugely difficult control freak who works 20 hours a day, superhuman genius who doesn't understand us mere humans, uh, apparently is a really hard to work for and apparently really hard to be. He's clearly burning himself out. But at least he's not using the best minds of a generation to figure out how to get people to clink ad links uh, like Google or Facebook. He's trying, at least he says, to save humanity and has repeatedly taken huge, huge risks with his fortune uh, and repeatedly come to the verge of bankruptcy in order to further that goal. That's pretty freaking awesome. And I'm glad sci-fi pushed him there. But I'm also worried about what he and the others didn't learn from sci-fi. You know, for all the sci-fi stories of tech hubris, 
hubris, tech hubris, um, from Frankenstein until today, or, or stories about the failure of technology to solve human problems, the tech billionaires seem convinced that the tech they're building is the road to utopia, which often leads them to think too much about their ideas of the future and not enough about people here in the present. Um, a great example uh, is AI. People like Musk and Gates fear a Skynet future where super AIs are going to take over. People like Page are worried about the rights of those super AIs and, and uh, literally calling it speciesism uh, for you to hate and fear them. Um, but they're both focused over focusing on the impact of tomorrow's artificial general intelligence and not enough on the impact of today's artificial narrow intelligence and the discriminatory impacts that automated decision making based on biased data uh, and algorithms can have on the lives and livelihoods of people right now. People who are being over-policed based on algorithmic decisions, uh, sentenced based on algorithmic decisions, uh, being offered or denied credit or jobs based on algorithmic decisions, or just for example, having their black faces being mistaken by facial recognition AI for monkeys, or mug shots, or not even being recognized as human at all. Um, this is what AI researcher Kate Crawford calls AI's white guy problem. And every time I hear a tech billionaire talk about going to space or uploading his brain rather than how to make AIs less racist or, or address the economic upheaval that, for example, replacing all truck drivers with robots is going to bring, I realize what a big problem it is. And it's at least partly sci-fi's fault, not least because sci-fi has pushed endless power fantasy narratives of libertarian big thinkers and great men who bend history and boy saviors that rescue society from itself. Um, stories that these billionaires internalized, stories that I internalized. Um, Kirk's gunboat diplomacy spreading Western values on the final frontier, the prime directive be damned. John Luke did a much better job of that. Um, Ender of Ender's Game, Paul Atreides of Dune, literally any Heinlein hero, and of course, Harry Seldon of Isaac Asimov's foundation, saving the galactic empire with his brain. There's a distinct feeling that these tech billionaires want to count themselves in that company. And certainly Musk thinks it's his destiny to make us a space-faring space -faring species. Page seems to think that Google may be the next step in evolution as we give birth to our AI mind children. And there's also a distinct feeling on the public's part, I think, that these dreams, these futures, aren't really about us or for us. They're about them or for them, and maybe they're techno elite friends who may actually be able to afford to upload as AIs or go to Mars or hide in their orbital colonies or seasteaded innovation zones or whatever when the world finally goes to shit for the rest of us. Which is maybe a part of why everyone is finally getting kind of angry at them. But just so you don't think I'm being unfair, uh, here in the final stretch is where I actually turn the same critique back on myself and on my worldview and to some extent on the movement that raised me because a lot of what I just said applies there too. Uh, like Barlow and his contemporaries, like many of the tech billionaires, I was inspired by essentially libertarian sci-fi visions, especially those of the hacker frontiersmen fighting the man. I wanted to be a policy hacker on the electronic frontier in a movement that in its founding anyway, was frankly primarily concerned with the rights of a middle to upper class, mostly white, mostly male constituency of early internet users, tech professionals and hackers. But now I, we all are having to grapple with the fact that underlying both the original digital rights frame and these tech billionaires frame is at least to some extent an essentially privileged vision of the future focused on a technological elites escape from or elevation above the restrictions of the regular world, whether through outer space or cyberspace, rather than a transformation of society here and now that benefits all people which I think is one of the reasons why we in the internet are in the mess that we're in now and why our movement, especially in the last few years, is recognizing that it has to grapple with and integrate perspectives that haven't been at the center of our digital rights discourse before, uh, rather than that discourse continuing to be dominated by a small group of libertarian techie white folk from the coasts like me. Um, for example, civil rights voices are now raising very real concerns about online hate speech and how the internet is facilitating the rise of white nationalism. And I think it's fair to say the traditional digital rights groups didn't foresee that. And we, we now have to grapple with that concern and reconcile it somehow with our pro-free free speech vision of the internet. 
Um, other voices on both the left and the right are raising very real concerns about the tech giant's super centralization of power, which again, I don't think we fully foresaw. And now our movement's traditional keep your hands off the internet posture is having to evolve too, as we consider whether and how best to regulate their power. Now to be clear, like with the tech billionaires, I think the accomplishments of the digital rights movement have been enormously positive and critically important. Nor do I mean to denigrate the legacy of John Perry, of course, who I adored, uh, nor, nor that of everyone else who's worked to further the dream of a free and open internet, myself included. Um, I'm proud of that vision. I'm proud of that work, not ashamed. And for what it's worth, I also freaking love Heinlein. Um, what I am saying, though, is that we need to look beyond the sci-fi visions that originally sparked this movement, stories of elite rebels trailblazing at the edge of society, and find new sci-fi stories that recognize that we're no longer on the frontier. The frontier has been settled. We now live in a large and diverse and very troubled online community coping with a range of unanticipated threats that won't be solved and indeed may be exacerbated by the uncritical pursuit of technological achievement by a handful of tech billionaires or elite hackers. We need a sci-fi feedback loop that involves all our voices, stories of a future that includes all of us, which is one of the reasons why I love Dragon Con so much, because it seeks to welcome sci-fi fans from ev of every stripe and every class and every color and every gender and every ability. Uh, it recognizes sci-fi and fandom as a community uh, and as a communal endeavor and recognizes the need to welcome and center voices beyond those that have traditionally dominated the field. I think that's the only way we'll find those new stories that we need to guide our next steps, which is why I was so heartened to see uh, Nora Jemison's historic victory at the Hugos two weeks ago. Uh, not only the first black author to win the best novel Hugo, but now the first author ever to win it three years in a row for a, a great series, the Broken Earth Trilogy, that grapples with issues of power and race and gender and ecological disaster in a way that someone without her perspective never could have. Um, and it's with a few words from her acceptance speech that I'd like to end my talk. Nora said, I look to science fiction and fantasy as the aspirational drive of the zeitgeist. We creators are the engineers of possibility. And as this genre finally, however grudgingly, acknowledges that the dreams of the marginalized matter and that all of us have a future, so will go the world. Soon, I hope. Thank you very much. Um, so, oh, thanks. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, as Dave said, I've written about some of this stuff before. You can find it on Medium. Um, I welcome questions. I also welcome any ideas or stories you guys have about the sci-fi feedback loop as you've observed it in your own life or in the world around you. Um, but yeah, to you guys. Thank you. Really intense, and I didn't know a lot of that stuff. Um, I just wanted to say that I know you didn't have a lot of time about it, but uh, mood-altering drugs and like psychiatric drugs are a super huge part of that feedback loop. I think so. If you ever want to write about that, <laughs> that would be pretty cool. So there, I mean, I wasn't joking. There's a really interesting, and again, this is very 90s, uh, but, but Timothy Leary was really into the internet uh, and into space colonization as sort of part of the same project as LSD in terms of mind expanding technology. And, and I, I think that, I thought that that was a really interesting, interesting thing that I, I hadn't really recognized. Thank you so much. Ooh. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, Thanks, Amy. You ended on a really powerful note, but I couldn't help but notice, as I am wont to do, that you only actually used the names of three women during the entire presentation, and only one identifiable person of color that I was able to recognize. Mm -hmm. um, 
besides that, I did some looking. There's a amazingly lengthy discussion, a Wikipedia article, uh, science fiction written by black authors dating back to the 19th century. Did you do research into how those writings, writings of other women, impacted this movement in order to, could that be integrated into this um, to give a voice to those populations in the history of the tech policy movement and why they aren't bigger in influencing the people who are setting, monet uh, who have the money to be setting policy mm -hmm. today and why those voices aren't being heard more? Um, that's a lot of potential avenues of research. Um, one of the reasons why uh, the talk was so heavy on white male authors is because that seems to be who has had the most influence on these white male tech billionaires who were sort of the center of the critique. Um, but, uh, so I'm not sure, uh, is the question, have I researched why voices of people of color and women have not been more central to the sci-fi discourse? Yes, I think there is. Oh, it's already time. Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming and uh, sitting through such a long talk. I really appreciate it.